I wanted to do is because I didn't know who to expect. So my plan was to talk about first an introduction, general introduction about machine learning, about where, where I'm coming from, so everybody's on the same level, and then I'll get to some specifics about Swift implementations. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Swift, but the only thing we have for machine learning are some neural networks for work with already trained data, and it has a little bit of computer vision algorithms like face recognition, but it's, everything is a black box. There's no no option to change. So what I started doing w with a few guys I found on GitHub is implementing Swift algorithms natively, like trying to implement them. So well, my objective, to, my goal today is to like share a little bit of the biggest problems that I found, like and how to work around them. Is that okay? Yes. I think <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's start then. Let's start then. This is about me. I'm a software engineer in software for one and a half years year already. Uh, I have a background with Android and iOS. And while while I was studying for my master's degree, I was researching data science in Brazil, <laughs> actually. And my my master thesis was about predicting three-dimensional structures of proteins. Uh, we didn't get much about it, but it was really fun working with it. And yeah, just so you know who I am. <laughs> As I said, we're going to talk about machine learning. I don't bother about this time, so I'm going to make it faster. And then we're going to talk about Swift. So what is artificial intelligence in general? It's not this guy. <laughs> How to go full screen? No, it doesn't matter. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. You can hear me well? Yeah. Yep. OK, perfect. So let's talk about <laughs> Okay, did you miss anything before this? Or I was just explaining, like, did you miss the slide as well? I think, yes, I didn't yeah. see this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was going to explain that basically machine learning is dealing with data using an algorithm and looking at your predictions. And we should not treat the algorithm as a black box creature. That was what I was trying to say. And Working with the data, having good data, is much more important than choosing a good algorithm. It's like a thousand times more important. So that's why I wanted to talk to you about data. And data has two types. It can be <laughs> you can know or not the output. So if you, this, is, for example, is a four-dimensional data set. For example, for human resources, it has less evaluation number of projects. This person has worked. This each row is a person. Okay. Uh, this is the average monthly hours the person works and the number of years the person spent on the company and if you left or no, yes or no. Okay? So in this data set in particular, we know the output. We know the classes of the output, for example, if you left or no. So this data set we can call labeled. If we didn't know this guy, it would be unlabeled. So what does this mean is that the type of algorithms you're going to use are different. And as I can already tell you, supervised algorithms, or when you know this column, they work a lot better. So if you don't have this guy, it would be really nice. <laughs> I wrote here to pay somebody to do it, but you can do it yourself. Um, for example, when I was in, in the university, we had we were trying to make a finger detection. Machine. So we created a, a little program where we could put in each image where the fingers were. This is called marking your data or labeling your data. Okay? Uh, just to make sure you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> so I, I also talked about feature scaling, which is when you have numbers which, is, which are bad to work with, for example, huge numbers or strings or true or false, and your algorithm depends on mathematical calculations. For example, calculating distances, like k-means does, k 
k-means is an algorithm or gradient descent, you're going to have to normalize your data. And normalizing, usually mean max, is the most common way to normalize, is putting the interval of your data, putting all the data you have on the interval of minus 1 to 1 or 0 to 1, and not integer, of course, double. It can be like 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the, you also have to know that some algorithms don't really need this, don't really care about this. So train symbol methods like random forest or grading boosting machines are algorithms that do not need feature scaling. Also, and lastly about this, is that the type of data matters. Obviously, you guys, everybody here knows this, that unsigned int operations are much, much, much faster than double operations. Okay? So, once you have your data set, it's marked, everything's fine, you should first remove sparse data. For example, removing repeated columns, as you can see here, as in brown. And also, it is very nice to balance your outputs. So in this column, you can see that you have a lot of ones, a lot of people who left, and not a lot of people who stayed in the company. So this is going to create bias in your algorithm, and bias is bad. So what, what can be done is randomly balancing your outputs, which means that you're going to, in the end, you, you, you eliminate rows, random rows until you have the same number of outputs, the same people, number of people who left and who didn't left. Of course, 8, as you can see here, 8 is a very small data set, so it's just an example, okay? Uh, also, dimensions, if your data set has thousands, hundreds of thousands of dimensions, there is, there are things you can do about it. So, one thing which I'm going to talk in the next slide is examining the correlation between each dimension, each feature, and the output, and also running principal component analysis, which is going to calculate the eigenvalues of the matrix you have, and analyze which features are more important. And feature engineering is when you look at your data from from like a person standpoint, not no algorithms, and you look, hey, this guy doesn't make any sense at all. You can remove it. This is going to happen a lot of times, and I'm going to show you in the next slides. This correlation matrix, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but on each on each uh, row here in column, you see a variable. For example, satisfaction level of the employee, still using the human resources database, okay? The last evaluation, the number of projects, blah, 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 how many work accidents this person had, how many promotions this person had in the last five years, and if he left, yes or no. So the correlation works like this. The smaller these numbers, this number is, it means that there is a tendency that if this guy goes down, satisfaction level goes down, the this variable goes down as well. So people with low satisfaction, you can see, are going to be a lot more prone to leave the company. It, it sounds a little obvious, but if you if you have numbers to back that up, it is very important. So each, each item here goes from minus one to one. And if you look, I marked as in a green box here these features, because they represent the most correlated values. Except for this little guy, they represent the most correlated values. So I'm choosing these guys, these features that you've already seen, to work in this example. Okay? Everybody following me? <laughs> yes. You can stop me anytime if you have questions, okay? Uh, predictions, let's talk about a little bit about it. Oops, here it is. So in machine learning, you're always going to have two types of algorithms. One are classifiers. So a classifier does, imagine all these points are black. A classifier will put them in one or in many classes. In this example, two, green or red. So this blue line kind of would not look like this, but this blue line is a classifier. What the algorithm uses to classify the data. So everything that is inside this area would be one class. Everything that is outside would be another class. And a regression is finding a function that better fits all the points. So the blue was calculated by the, by the algorithm, and the red are the data you have. I hope everything is clear. Let's move on. Data splitting is how to work with your data set. For example, if you have 1,000, 
how would how much would you use to train? How much would you use to validate? How much would you use to test? This there's a lot of debate. I I personally use this formula, and a lot of people use it, and it is recommended that you use 60% for your training set, which means that this is what you're going or within basically is going to use to train to learn how to predict. And then you use the test set, which should be around 20%, to optimize, like change the parameters, change the algorithm, learn about how to work with your data. And the validation side is you're never going to touch it just when you're going <laughs> to write your results on a paper. <laughs> and I had this quote here, but you can read it, read it later in the presentation. It, it's just what I said, but in a better way. Um, metrics are a way to know. As I was talking about here, we're going to, we need to measure how our algorithm is performing, so we can use metrics. And as you can see here, there's four types of data. True positive is it was one thing and you said correctly. True negative, it was another thing and you said correctly. False positive, you said it was positive, but it was not. And false negative, you said it was negative, but it was positive. There are many algorithms, the most com many ways to calculate how good your algorithm is. The most common is accuracy, which is the number of true positives plus the number of true negatives divided by everything. But there are others. I personally like this kappa. It should be double P here. Metric, because uh, it doesn't depend on balance, on your outputs being balanced. So, and it also measures if your algorithm is out overfitting. So, there's, you need to check what is better for you. I'm not going to get much into details here. Uh, but overfitting that I just said is when your algorithm creates crazy functions to, to predict something that should be simpler. Here is red is what an algorithm did, and green is what it should be. Blue is your data. So you see that the algorithm perfectly fits every point in your data set, but if you were to pick a random point, here, for example, that it should be here, the algorithm would put something crazy like here. Or even worse, as you can see here, you can see in my mouse, right where there's this X, while the point should have been here, the algorithm is going to put something like here. And yeah, that's overfitting. Now, there's a lot of algorithms. As I've been saying a lot of weird names. <laughs> I know, but let's talk about supervised classifiers. The unsupervised ones are, as I said, like um, neural networks or k-means or a lot of those deep learning algorithms, but these are the guys that win competitions, okay? So basically, these two guys, random forest gradient boosting machines, are tree and symbol methods, naive base, is an under algorithm, and there's support for support vector machines, there's others, many others. But I want to get into forests. Why? Because they're widely used. Like, mm, as I said, many of the da data mining competitions on Kaggle are won, or by random forest, or by gradient boosting machines. Um, they do not depend on, on your feature scaling. Uh, they can learn more interaction between the features, like if there's correlation between the features, not between a feature and an output, it can learn that better. And it is widely used in the industry, so it is a good reason. Quickly, let's talk about the algorithm. You create a lot of trees, let's say 500, and for each tree, you have a subset of the features, and you're going to randomly pick this subset. It, it is very common to use the square root number of the features. For example, if you have nine, you're going to randomly choose three for each feature. If you use, ever used Python, this is the M tri parameter, very important. Um, it is also very common in algorithms to have a minimum number of elements a node can have. And you can also have weights. A lot of random forest implementations let you put weights in different features. And 
each tree is going to be trained with a random subset of the data. So how does this, I don't know if you guys are familiar with decision trees, but this is how it works. You have a lot of those data that I've shown, for example, and here you're going to randomly pick a feature. So for example, how many times the person spent on the company, and then you're going to calculate something called Gini index, which is going to like split the 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 data you have. So for example, let's say that your Gini index for a number of years the person spent on the company is three. So everybody that has more than three years goes to the right. Everybody that has less than three years goes to the left. So you do this for a lot of trees, for a lot of variables, and after you have, this is the training part, okay? After you trained everything, how do you predict? So you get a new instance, run through all the trees, and get the majority. So if the majority of the trees said that this person is going to leave the company, then you decide that the final decision is that this person is going to leave the company. Everybody understood this? Or was I too fast? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the last thing I want to talk about, probably not the last, but almost the last thing, is cross-validation. It's very normal, very normal. Every paper that you see for machine learning has a validation part. And cross-validation is a really simple concept. You're going to, for example, if you want to do a tenfold cross-validation, which is what everybody does, or a six-fold, but... In this example, it's a tenfold cross-validation. You're going to split, randomly split, all the data you have in 10, get one of them, randomly here, like for example, the, the first one, train with the rest, and validate with this guy. So you're going to get an accuracy. And then you do this for all the other parts, because you split in 10, so you have 10 parts. Do this for all the parts, and then you run your final accuracy on the average of every single element. So this is a much more meaningful output for you, and much less biased, of course. It, it completely eliminates bias. Uh, now let's talk about Swift implementation. Is everybody OK? Can you hear me? Give me some feedback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going too fast? Oh, it's been half an hour already. Let's go. So. I was implementing many algorithms in Swift, as I mentioned, like from scratch, like starting again. And these are the three biggest problems I found. No, actually, three suggestions that I found that are interesting, I thought would be interesting to share. So let's talk about them. First thing is generics. So it is very important to have a, a standard side sa type, sorry, <laughs> a standard type so that your algorithm treats everything equally. So you have a protocol, for example, numeric, and you have some functions. So you can create extensions, for example, double extension double numeric. So for all, for all the types you want to work with, you create an extension, and then all the algorithm does is treat them as the same type. Um, so then I, I tried to create like a generic a protocol for a classifier algorithm. And the problem here was that protocols cannot be generic in Swift, at least until now. Maybe in the future they will be. But you have to go out, you have to use associated types. And that creates a lot of problems further on, uh, as I will explain. So for example, this is a, a type of protocol. It has a step to train, a step to classify, and Run classifier is going to do everything but asynchronously, so you can see there is a closure here. If you're not familiar with Swift, I'm <laughs> sorry, but if you have any questions and you're not familiar with Swift, I will be more than happy to explain, okay? Um, so then we need a concrete implementation, and I will talk to about why we need this in the next slide, but then you create a concrete implementation of a gener generic classifier algorithm that's going to use this type of numeric. And then, it, because you used associated type, you have to use type Elias here and create a new type for the generic one. 
And because this is still the, on the generic side, you really ha you really have to make your subclasses override these guys from the protocol. So why do we need this guy? Basically, because if we don't have this concrete implementation of the protocol, you're going to have to use the where clause on every class that you want to use the algorithm, and you're going to have to have two types, the classifier algorithm and the numeric, and define that it's an ugly construction to have on every class that you want to use. Plus, the biggest problem is that view controllers cannot be generic. Unless you instantiate your view controllers programmatically, like unless you kick storyboards from everything you have, you cannot work with generic protocols if you don't have the concrete implementation because you're never going to be able to initialize them on a view controller. So, for example, an algorithm, random first, for example, would over, uh, implement this protocol, and you can just create a, a gener uh, generic variable. For example, classifier, is, which is the type classifier algorithm, and then you have to specify which type of numeric you're using, for example, int, and you initialize it normally. I know it looks a little, it may be, it looks obvious for you, but it took some time to get to this <laughs> recipe. <laughs> um, also, talking about matrices, which is like the core fundamental of machine learning algorithms, Swift arrays are really slow. I can show you the numbers later on, but they're really slow when allocating and deallocating. And I was I was researching this a lot and like for example how does other libraries do this? And for example OpenCV it uses C pointers, which you're gonna see here later on that C pointers are much faster to allocate and deallocate because you're dealing directly with the memory. And Python, for example, it does some magic where it never deallocates it. It just allocates once and, and it's there and it it doesn't get deallocated. But if you create, for example, a copy, it's going to be just a reference. I don't really understand how it works, but it's super fast. So if you decide to implement machine learning algorithms in Swift, don't use Swift arrays. That's my tip. <laughs> and SRAs are a little faster, but still slow. And C pointers are the fastest. But you have to deal with memory. You cannot use ARC. That's why they every pointer variable is called unsafe. Everything is unsafe. And if you start using unsafe and to mutable pointers, you're going to see that most of the C memory functions don't work correctly. For example, real lock, mem copy, memory move, they will do crazy stuff. So what I mean crazy stuff is that they're not always going to work as you expected. You're going to have uh, trash data on your arrays. It happens to me a lot. Uh, Google does a lot. And if you actually look at the documentation for unsafe immutable pointers, it says do not use, it's not going to work. So then it tells you to use unsafe immutable raw pointers. And the bonus here, as I wrote, is that they will work with the accelerate framework. And if you, if you don't know what the accelerate framework is, it is an Apple framework to do advanced calculation on matrices. So, if you have really big matrices, it's going to be very, but they have to be unsafe multiple raw pointer matrices. They're going to have faster algorithms for inversing matrix transpose. I don't know how it does it. I, mean, I, I was thinking that it somehow uses the graphic card for this on the iPhone, but I'm not 100% sure. But it has good performance, especially for the eigenvalues if you have, if you're running principal component analysis. Um, so, for example, you define a grid or an array with unsafe multiple pointers, and you can allocate it. Ah, it's also important to initialize. I don't really get why you need to allocate and initialize the memory, but if you do not initialize, you're going to have unexpected results as well. And it, as I said, it's important to deallocate. So, 
forgetting and setting elements, for example, you, you have to assume your memory is bound to a type, for example, an integer, so it knows how many bytes it's going to have, and then you can normally access it. Um, also, for an example of a deleting routine, if I want to remove a ro rows in a range, um, so what we're going to do, what I'm doing here, but maybe there's another way, but this is an example. I'm manually shifting all the bits from this range and then reallocating the memory to the new size. So I know this may look a little obvious, but a lot of it, it took a lot of time to figure out exactly how to work with the memory. And finally, something very convenient that you're gonna find in a, no, in a lot of a lot of libraries, machine learning libraries, are optional parameters. So, for example, this is a k-means example of an algorithm. And if you're not familiar with k-means, it's gonna have a number of centroids to calculate, a number of maximum iterations that it can run, and a convergence delta. So, if it changes. If all the points change less than this, it stops working. Not stops working, stops training. Uh, so the person who is needing initializing this class doesn't really have to declare this, the send these parameters. They can be optional. It's very convenient. But I just wanted to leave this here. And that's all for me, for my side, guys. I wanted, if I had more time, I wanted to show you a little bit of implementations, but only if you really want. Do you have any questions or answers? Final considerations? Yeah, so, um, go ahead, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for presentation and maybe it would be useful to uh, pay like more attention on actually uh, like the, th the theory because, uh, for instance, I'm pretty new to machine learning and uh, algorithms, so it would be nice to have like some background. Because uh, before starting to implement something, you need to understand it really well. But it was very interesting. Thank you. Yes, I I just wanted to make it clear that. Machine learning algorithms are really simple statistical calculations. For example, on the random forest example, is a majority voting. There is not, there is not even some magical thing happening here. It's randomly picking a subset of the features you have and using the Gini index, which is really a small multiplication calculation. And splitting your data set, data set in trees and majority voting is like something super simple that wins a lot of competitions, international competitions. I just wanted to create this, like, clear this myth that there is no black box thing and you should not use. You cannot get far treating this as a black box. But thank you for your comment. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to thank you as well, Lucas. It was pretty interesting. And um, I have just one question. So can you name a few applications uh, for these algorithms uh, for machine learning or deep learning that can be used directly on the mobile devices? So without the processing on back end, like what we can do directly on mobile devices and what the applications of that? Um, some things that I've seen happening a lot is creating categories for images automatically. So you have an image, for example, of a person, and it's going to say person, brown hair, forest. Let's say if you have a person with brown hair in a forest background. This is like super easy to do. It can be done natively on the device. Uh, It is really up to your imagination. For example, 
if you wanna, you can create. I'm just like creating imaginary applications, okay? If you have, if you have a, a spot on your skin and you wanna know if it's cancer or not, there's a lot of things. It's super easy to know. It's like a variation of color, of size, of irregular shape, volume. So you can create, for example, an application that takes a picture of this and it tells you you have cancer or not. For example, you know. And how this would work in an algorithm, for example, is that you treat the image as a bunch of features. So each pixel is going to be a feature. So if the image is, I don't know, 100 by 100, it's going to have 100 square dimensions. Is it clear? Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, you should expect a lot of false positives over there. <laughs> In this example, yes, yeah. but then, uh, then again, I would not even recommend using random forest. Uh, and as I said, uh, in an example like this, the most, most, most important thing would be treating the data. Like, for example, cropping the picture to a small size so you can deal with a small size of features so you don't have a lot of dimensions. Um, also, changing the image values, for example, increasing a lot the, the exposition, exposure, sorry, of the image, so you, you get better, more important color variation. And as I said, the most important thing is treating data. It's much more important than choosing a good classifier is treating data. And data treating, it's super easy to do on a device, it can be done. Especially nowadays with iPhones having <laughs> extra good processors. Yeah. If you have any ideas of uh, applications, I really can help you. Yeah, uh, not so far. <laughs> so really cool to hear that. Thank you. And as was uh, commented before, um, it would be great to hear you again with some theory of machine learning and deep learning and other stuff. Really? I could yeah. get, I could, well, we can talk about this. <laughs> I see, I thought there's a lot of, but like you're interested in the theor theoretical part, right? Yeah, because um, our project uses mainly Python and Java, so it's not applicable in the near future to use some other languages. So the theoretical part was like uh, most helpful uh -huh. on today's meeting. Beautiful. No, because I wanted to say that if you're if you're gonna have an algorithm, if you're if you need machine learning, unless you really need it to be done natively on a device, and if you are in this case, then I my suggestions really apply. But the best way is to have a server running the algorithms in Python. Uh, for the for the human resources example that I said, the my classifier that I implemented in Swift ran in five minutes. In Python, it ran in less than three seconds. Mm -hmm. So going with Python on a back on a server is really the way to go here. Okay, <laughs> unless you really need it natively, which is why I'm um, <laughs> giving this talk. <laughs> Yeah, it's cool when you have internet connection, <laughs> but when you're somewhere in the mountains trying to find what the class of iris is, is it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> for example, if you want to have a, a classifier for mushrooms, like is this yeah. mushroom poisonous or no? This would be the perfect apl apl application. <laughs> cool. Thanks again. Thank you. I hope uh, that's all. That's all questions uh, guys have to ask you for uh, now. I hope you are uh, open for offline questions, right? I am very open. As you can see, my email is here. On the <laughs> you can contact me anytime or in any way possible, okay? Good. Thank you, Lucas, for such presentation. Uh, it was really great to hear some updates from you about machine learning and I have an announcement about machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, we are going to have a pacemaker. It's, um, 
uh, internal conferences for soft servers, uh, actually devoted to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, it's going to happen in Kyiv, uh, September 9. And uh, actually, we closed the registration uh, on Friday, but if you are in Kyiv and you are interested in artificial intel intelligence and machine learning, you are welcome to to visit the conference. Uh, we have our official uh, Facebook group, Peacemaker Conference, with events and uh, uh, on on internal uh, Facebook and external and uh, you can find all the details there one more time lucas thank you for such sparkling speech i hope that's to see awesome you. thank you i hope to see you as a speaker maybe in a while and uh, everybody have a good day bye 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 thanks bye yeah.